Uh, welcome everybody to yet another conversation in out of Kreisky's Wohnzimmer. I'm very glad that you that you have joined us, and we are all aware that in uh, sort of in everybody's mind, for first and foremost, we are dealing now with two spectacular crises. The one is the crisis in Ukraine. The a uh, vicious attack of uh, of Russia on on an independent country. The second one is the uh, the consequences of the terrorist attack uh, by uh, groups from Hamas on Israel, and the consequences that have uh, uh, escalated over the last uh, over the last couple of weeks, and that are uh, in in um, sort of the, the impact and the consequences also on public opinion are uh, very, very difficult to, to deal with. Uh, today, we won't talk primarily about the conflict as such, but rather about the consequences that arise from this conflagration. Uh, consequences uh, on the American political system, on the political situation, on uh, the various constraints that are put on the administration, but also the consequences for Europe and as such on the consequences of for the for the transatlantic relations. Uh, I'm delighted that we have two, renowned guests for this conversation. And I'm very happy to welcome Ellen Leibson uh, and uh, Henri Barquet. Uh, both of them extremely knowledgeable about um, affairs of the, of the Middle East. Uh, Mrs. Leibson is a former president of a well-known Washingtonian think tank, the Simpson Center, uh, Henri Barke is university professor at Lehigh University, but also a specialist for Middle East affairs at the Council on Foreign Relations. Thank you for joining us and welcome to, to both of you. Thank you. Um, let me start out uh, with a, a first question to, to both of you. Uh, we all know uh, about the deep commitment of the United States to the state of Israel as such. Uh, the commitment for continued political, financial, military support. Uh, a support that has always been unconditional and on which Israel could ally. And nevertheless, I have now, and perhaps I'm mistaken, but it's my perception or my feeling that in many things that come out now of Washington, there's always a little but, yeah? Uh, the, what, what you hear is uh, certainly Israel has the right of self-determination, uh, of, of self-defense, but is the measure really commensurate? Is, uh, is it, uh, it, does it really respond to the, to, the, to the crisis? Israel has certainly a right to fight against terrorism, but not every Palestinian is a terrorist. And there are so many factions and other things that are to be considered. Military action is uh, inevitable, but uh, is the destruction and and uh, the takeover of Gaza really uh, in line with with the the task on international law? Did you have to protect civilian lives and that you have to minimize? In so uh, these are. Uh, these are things that and one asks oneself, and this is a question that I would like to put to you. Uh, how are the constraints on, on uh, the U.S. administration here? Uh, are they sort of sailing between a rock and a hard place? And is it uh, public opinion? 
J Street, IPAC and so on, who are all Congress, who are all uh, either uh, influencing sort of decision making and exerting pressure. Uh, I would like, uh, Ellen, would you like to go first? Sure. So uh, thank you, Ava. And we've started out with a, a genuine uh, dilemma for the United States. Um, you're certainly correct that, you know, the continuity of American support for Israel, whether it has a change of government, that there is still a, a very deep basis of both shared values and shared interests, a perception that Israel is a on balance, a security, a positive security asset for American interests, but also entitled to its uh, democratic culture, et cetera. But certainly that vision of Israel is challenged from time to time. It's not the first time that the U.S. has had to sort of publicly say to Israel, uh, you know, we support you, but, um, you know, please modify your behavior in some way. When um, President Bush 41, the old, the elder Bush, uh, had a showdown with the Israelis and Congress over the uh, money that Israel was spending on settlements, contrary to U.S. law. Mm -hmm. So there was a brief moment, yeah. I believe it lasted two yeah. years, where the United States uh, restricted and even suspended uh, some part of our assistance to Israel because we had a very deep disagreement over uh, spending on Israeli settlements. Over time, we clearly lost that battle in the sense that Israel proceeded with settlement construction in ways that impeded the shared objective or the international objective of um, you know, restoring the rights of the Palestinians through some form of political independence. So um, you know, we're facing a, a terrible dilemma now. A President Biden, I believe, was operating both from his heart and his head after October 7th, when he felt a very strong sense of you know, moral uh, imperative to support Israel after the horrendous, horrendous and, and really grotesque attack by Hamas against um, innocent Israeli civilians. You know, was Hamas, you know, they also attacked Israeli military targets, but the damage done to Israeli civilians was was extreme. But clearly, over the weeks, the U.S. administration has first privately and then publicly said to the Israelis, um, you know, we're really uncomfortable with the tactics you're using. This absolute bombardment of Gaza, the collateral damage, you, you say you are, you know, being careful about civilians, but the collateral damage is so uh, extreme that so the U.S. administration, including the National Security Advisor flying again uh, to Israel to try to set some um, change the expectations on how Israel should proceed with its military campaign is clearly underway. Domestically, you've mentioned, you know, who's who's pressuring the administration in what direction. Um, I, I, I think that within Democratic Party circles, there's clearly uh, a, a human rights component of people uh, being uncomfortable with the uh, administration giving Israel a green light for the, a military campaign that seems to be open-ended right now. The latest is the Israelis have said they need a few more, you know, maybe the end of the year, maybe a few more months. Um, the U.S. obviously just vetoed at the U.N. Uh, a call for a ceasefire. Um, but we really do have friction now in, uh, you know, uh, domestically, in part because American society is quite agitated about this with both uh, Jewish Americans and Muslim Americans feeling that the conflict has entered our, you know, domestic sense of of peace and security, particularly on college campuses. Um, but I, so I do think the Biden administration runs the risk of looking weak, of looking like it doesn't have as much leverage over Israel as um, people expect it to have. The working with the Arab countries has also been um, a very important piece of this. I thought it was interesting that Jake Sullivan went to Saudi Arabia as well as to Israel. Um, maybe we'll talk about the Abraham Accords later, but. Um, I am uh, so I, I acknowledge what you're saying that this war is both a foreign policy challenge for the Biden administration, and it does seem to be having some domestic repercussions. Of the two wars, Ukraine and Gaza, the Republicans seem to be more. They, the Republicans so far are supporting uh, our embrace of Israel's, 
need to defend itself. Um, and But they are challenging uh, President Biden on his Ukraine policy. So maybe we'll want to differentiate between those two. Thank you very much. Uh, Henri, would you like to comment also? Look, there's not much uh, to add to what Ellen said, uh, but I would just um, try to emphasize uh, something else. And that is that it is kind of very surprising to me that in the war against Hamas, that the Israelis don't really have any political objectives. I mean, the wars are political events. You have to have political objectives. And the Israelis have not really, other than saying, uh, we want to destroy Hamas, which clearly that is in and of itself is not a really political objective because you don't def you have, they haven't defined what they mean by de de destroying Hamas. So I suspect that there's something else going on here. And, and this is why um, it is very important to understand the motivation of the Israelis and because that may also be the answer to finding some kind of a solution for a ceasefire. I think the Israelis are very worried about the hostages. I think Hamas may not have all the hostages. And the hostage issue somehow has dropped off the radar screen and they're not being talked about as much. Although Biden met with the families of some of the hostages. <clears throat> but I would say there is something else about the hostages. Look, the Israeli military... I'm sure is not happy with this policy that Netanyahu is pushing. But why they haven't they objected more forcefully is to me the interesting question. And the only hypothesis I have, and this is only hypothesis, is that there are a number of military hostages that they, they are very, very worried about, that, that what Hamas may do to them or what Hamas may do with them. And I heard that some of the concerns in Israel may have to do with the fact that these maybe some senior officers may be actually be kind of smuggled out to Iran or somewhere else. And that is what is maybe driving the Israeli military to to with this ferocious attack on, on Gaza because they want either to prevent this from happening or try to show Hamas that Hamas will pay a huge price if anything were to happen to the hostages. And that may be also the way to deal, to get to a ceasefire. I mean, if you can have a deal on, on hostages, I think the Israelis will go for a ceasefire almost immediately. But but we don't we don't know. I mean, and be, I, I put this because Ellen basically said everything that could be said about this issue. I just wanted to add another perspective uh, to try to explain this because at the end of the day, Everybody wants a ceasefire, and and how would how do we get there is the issue. Yeah. Uh, I find it very interesting what you said about the lack of uh, sort of a perspective on a, a sustainable solution. Uh, we had uh, not so long ago a talk in Vienna by Margaret Macmillan, the British historian, who uh, has just published a book about war. Uh, in recently, and she spoke about war, and she said three things. She said the, the nobody who starts a war thinks about how he's going to end it. Uh, when you are in the war, the war de uh, develops its own dynamic, and in many cases, escapes sort of political steerage, and you cannot. Uh, influence uh, events in a certain direction. And the, the third thing that you said is nobody who starts a war thinks that he might lose it. Yeah. And uh, these are, I, I it, it's also something that is very much in discussion in Europe here, that uh, we don't see uh, what can be the political solution, the political end to this uh, to this confrontation, and uh, that uh, has, of course, that weighs on on public opinion. Hmm? Mm -hmm. 
what we're hearing, um, I've now been to two Arab countries, one of which was a, a, a Morocco is an Abraham Accord country and uh, Qatar is not, but Qatar has been deeply involved in um, uh, obviously working with both Israel, Egypt, the US uh, on these, on, on what had been a very brief but successful uh, initiative to release the hostages. And um, what, so certainly in the Arab world, the the perception is that Israel cannot total to go back to Henri's point, you know, total defeat of Hamas is not attainable. You can demilitarize Hamas. You cannot take away the the political and social movement part of Hamas. That is part of the the spectrum of political life in a, a Palestinian uh, politics. Um, but some people are saying that remember that if if we do try to launch new diplomacy for a two state solution, and many uh, Palestinians and and uh, nearby Arabs say they are willing to jump on board that effort uh, in in due course when the when the fighting stops, um, that you have to remember that the Palestinian Authority as a structure is weak but the government is still the PLO, the umbrella organization, and that Hamas would be part of a revitalization of Palestinian governance, um, and that Palestinians have to make choices. They would have to be given a chance to vote in some fashion at some point, and we don't know whether, you know, right now would Hamas be the dominant political choice of Palestinians? I think as the suffering goes on, some Palestinians, and this is reporting from organizations that still have a presence in Gaza, uh, Palestinians may have, you know, sort of felt exhilarated immediately after the, the horrible events of October 7th, but now they see Hamas as not caring enough about their well-being. And it is possible that Palestinian sentiment would turn against Hamas because they would be seen as having brought this terrible uh, destruction upon them. So, uh, but so if we try to be optimistic and we see American former diplomats and UN officials trying to generate some uh, smart thinking about how do we get back on a more constructive process, um, the Israelis should have no illusions that you know Hamas would still be part of the political landscape of of, Pal of Palestine, um, and there would be some level of uncertainty what. Palestinian voters' preferences would be if they were given a chance. So that all suggests that, you know, I think Israeli, certainly the current Israeli government, and even if Israel had a more moderate government, there will be great, uh, there's a great risk to them uh, to move in that direction. They don't want to be legitimizing Hamas as a legitimate political actor. Um, but if there were movement towards uh, that two-state solution that has been um, uh, the, you know, the perceived consensus or compromise solution, um, the Israelis would have to somehow accommodate themselves to that. Um, back to uh, Henri's point about whether the Israeli, mil the professional military, do they, my sense is that right now for perhaps because Israeli society is still quite traumatized, um, we d we're not seeing any splits yet in the Israeli national security establishment about whether this campaign is the smart way uh, to go or not. Certainly other Arab states perceive that Israel almost fell into Hamas's trap, that Israel's extremely strong reaction is what Hamas wanted. Um, and so that Hamas was willing to pay that short-term price thinking that there would be long-term political benefit. I just want to end with one point. It, the Jordanian foreign minister has now said that he believes Israel has already suffered a strategic defeat, whether they know it or not. So that's an ominous thought as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but this corresponds also with everything that we hear here in Europe. Uh, when one hears that uh, uh, so Hamas has gained more support in the West Bank, where the support for Hamas was originally very weak, but with uh, sort of uh, actions by the settlers against Palestinian villages and so forth, 
and as a consequence also of uh, of of the war, uh, Hamas has gained territory there. At the same time, uh, I think we we one has to be careful. This is something that we perhaps don't hear enough about. That Hamas is not a monolithic thing. We we speak about Hamas as if it were sort of one cohesive entity, but there are so many different organizations that are also operative in Gaza and uh, are also involved, for instance, in the hostage situation, the Islamic State, ISIS, and so forth. And the Hamas also is uh, is is. Uh, military terrorist uh, movement certainly it is also an elected government and to a certain extent also an ideology and all these components uh, somehow uh, have to be taken into account mm -hmm. I found it very interesting what you said about uh, the work of the international organizations uh, we had not so long ago a long talk here in the Kreisky Forum with the Secretary General of UNRWA mm -hmm. about the work that UNRWA is doing. And it's not only UNRWA, there are other UN organizations that are, that are also active in, in Gaza, and uh, especially uh, World Health Organization and, and others. Uh, the the rejection by Israel, of course, of the work that they are doing is doing a lot of harm to the international organizations also. And to multi multilateral diplomacy, per se. Uh, the UN folks that were at the Doha meeting just uh, over the weekend uh, were quite insistent that some of the uh, reporting is, is a bit misleading of whether the UN agencies withdrew their international staff. And apparently that was true for the political mission, the determination it was no longer uh, safe for them in, uh, in Gaza City. But most of the specialized agencies, UNICEF, UNRWA, the folks who run, you know, contribute to the health services, education system, food supply, uh, special programs for children, um, first of all, they're a mix of locally hired people that are Palestinian and international staff, and they were quite insistent that they are uh, still on the ground. They are completely overwhelmed and stressed over the lack of sufficient resources and not enough trucks coming through with supplies, but it sounded to me like they are um, still quite deeply committed to continuing their work even under extraordinarily difficult uh, circumstances. So, you know, the... Hamas is, a, on, the, on the one hand, a kind of strongman government, an authoritative, authoritarian uh, style government, but it has understood that the UN is providing uh, ex, you know, absolutely essential services and has been uh, for many years. Do you mm -hmm. think that the Abraham Accords will survive this present crisis? I, I was going to, I was going to suggest I, I wanted to say something else in re response to your some of your points you made Eva. Uh, look, it may seem like the Hamas is getting more support in the West Bank under the current circumstances, but we also have to not take every shall we say quick poll or every quick uh, analysis at the moment as the as a truth, there are going to be major, major changes once this war is over. And in some ways, I wish some of these had happened even before the war started. Number one, there will be a new Israeli political system. This government, everybody knows, is going to collapse and, um, and something else is going to replace it. There's going to be an investigation. They're not going to come out well. They're going to be um, really humiliated in many respects. So the, whatever comes out is going to be very different. So that gives it, once you have a new Israeli uh, government that is composed not of Netanyahu and his, and his colleagues, then we will have a different, shall we say, um, situation on situation on the ground both in Gaza 
in Palestine and, and, and in Israel, which will move things in a different way. Secondly, look, the Palestinians, uh, especially in Gaza, have not lived under a democracy. I mean, Hamas is, by any stretch of the imagination, they won elections in 2007, and that's the last time they did anything. Right? So let's not call, let's not say that they came to power um, democratically. There is no question that at the moment when you're under the kind of pressure that the Palestinians are, any country always rallies around the flag and they're going to rally around the current flag, which is Hamas. But once this is over, and I hope it's over soon, um, the, um, the, uh, the Palestinians will have to ask questions. Why did this happen to us? Somebody has to answer, just like the Israelis have to answer, uh, the Israeli government has to answer for what happened on October 7th, the Palestinians will have to go. And in many ways, this is awful to say, but I think new political, new political systems will emerge, new leaders will emerge uh, both, on both sides of, of this divide. And that actually may be a hopeful sign for, I mean, to the extent that I want to be optimi optimistic. The other problem with Hamas is also what you said, um, Eva, that yes, Hamas seemed to seem to have complete control of Gaza, but it didn't, because you have these other organizations, the Islamic Jihad and other organizations that have taken the hostages, and and part of the reason why the hostage crisis, the hostage negotiations did not succeed, is because I don't think Hamas could deliver uh, on on these. That means that Hamas. Yes, was in control of Gaza, but was not really in control of Gaza and allowed all these other organizations to emerge. So in some ways, Hamas really doesn't deserve to 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 be to be the government in, in and and in many ways um the the fact that you have all these other organizations complicates the hostage problem and, and and this is why we have fighting going on if there wasn't if the hostage crisis had ended <clears throat> there would not have been um more fighting in my view uh, on to Ellen about the Abrams accord she knows more about that than I do so Eva this is Abraham, a great hmm? about the Abraham accord sure. so I think there's a weird paradox right now which is the is everybody has just jumped to this conclusion that Either they're dead or they are on, you know, life support indefinitely because views of Israel have changed as a result of uh, Israeli conduct during this war. But strangely enough, I think we're also getting signals from both the Saudis and the Emiratis that um, uh, they don't want to cut off entirely that process. For the Saudis, let's remember, it was a triangular, it, you know, it was kind of hard to wrap your head around, but it was a, a three-way negotiation, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the U.S., and the Saudis have a wish list vis-a-vis -vis the United States that would be part of a deal that would lead to their uh, normalization with Israel. So they are not ready to say that that's over completely. Now, it's obviously on a long pause until circumstances improve, but um, so I don't think we should uh, assume that the Abraham Accords are we're just a short moment in history and are now over. I think that some version of uh, Gulf Israel security relations will um, resume. Remember for the Emirates, Hamas is also a terrible threat. I mean, th their perception is that Hamas is a very, very dangerous organization for you know, the, the moderate Arab societies. So, they have very little sympathy for Hamas. Um, and therefore they, I believe, see their partnership with Israel as serving a counter-extremism, counter-terrorism purpose. So the for the Saudis, it's a slightly different set of issues. They have to show leadership on the Palestinian question. I think they don't have the luxury based on their history and their pretensions, if you will, to being the the natural leader of the Islamic world based on the custodianship of the holy holy shrines and mosques. Um, I think they have to now uh, step up to the plate on being more of a champion of Palestinian rights than they have been, even though we know that this younger generation led by Mohammed bin Salman are less, you know, less deeply attached to the Palestinian cause. I think that now uh, that is politically um, imperative for them 
to show some leadership there. So it looks like a certainly a tactical disruption of that process, um, but I'm quite um, struck by the quiet messages we're getting that there there is not the intention to completely uh, turn away from that, um, that eventually they want to do both. They want to help the Palestinians and they want to continue on some kind of path. Now, Arabs do resent that the Israelis haven't embraced and the United States government hasn't embraced more um, Arab versions of how would you get from today to an, what the Arab peace plan that would lead to both recognition and recognition of a Palestinian state. So there's um, there's a lot of work to be done, but I don't think we should assume that um, the, that whole initiative that began in the Trump administration has completely um, fallen apart. Yeah. I, I completely agree with that analysis. It corresponds also to everything that we hear here. Uh, and it um, it is something which uh, uh, perhaps is, is occasionally ignored when, when one talks about the conflict, that this is also a conflict with enormous regional implications. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and that there is a whole region around it that has its own interests. And that uh, security interests, political interests, uh, uh, and that uh, should not be, uh, must not be ignored. Yeah, uh, I. That's uh, the reason why I asked about the uh, Abraham Accords, because uh, I would also think that this is uh, a, a process that has been started uh, where there is a lot of interest in the wider region to continue with, with uh, on this track. Uh, may I ask uh, a slightly different question? Uh, from your perspective, do you see any repercussions on the transatlantic relationship? I mean, in Europe, the situation is a little bit difficult because we have not managed really to hold the European Union as such together, yeah? Uh, as you saw in the vote in the, in the, in the General Assembly now, uh, I mean, um, Austria voted completely, Austria, the Czech Republic voted completely different than France, for instance. And so uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, a difficult situation because every country has its own relationship and uh, not only relationship with Israel and with the Palestinians, but also a different historical burden to carry. Uh, going together with the United States is very important to us. Uh, will we be able to maintain it? Uh, how do you see that? I, I, there is actually uh, an opportunity for a transatlantic, a transatlantic cooperation. I, in many ways, I think the um, the lack of a solution so far. Um, I, I, there are many reasons why we didn't see a solution so far, but it seems to me that if there was a joint, very powerful American European. Uh, proposal on the table, putting pressure on all sides. That it, when I say all sides, as you said, it's a regional conflict. So I would, I, I mean, not just Israel and Hamas, but Israel and Ham Hamas, the Palestinians, and the rest of the Arab world kind of have a, a, an enormous, a, a really major, major push, uh, where the Americans and Europeans agree on the basic. Um, Shall we say structure of a deal uh, that will, could go quite far, um, and it hasn't happened so far, as far as I can tell. Uh, there's been it's difficult, obviously, but and it takes time to come up with a, with a deal, a deal such as this one. But I would I, maybe they're working on it, and I wish they are. But but I think rather than look at this call between Europe and the United States. I think this should be an opportunity for two sides to work together in a constructive way, because I don't really see any other solution out, out here. I mean, some 
we we are going to have to to have a outside intervention of some sort to stop this. Yeah. Uh, what what we see here is that Europe, and this is perhaps uh, something which which is not easy for us to accept, but Europe has no real influence on this uh, on this conflict anymore. The... I, I, well, I don't buy that. I, I really don't buy that. I mean, uh, Europe Europe does have a great deal of influence by virtue of the aid it has given to the Palestinians yeah. over the years. That's it's the only... relationship with Israel. It, the interaction between, you know, the Arab world, I mean, no, it has. It's a question of maybe it hasn't figured out how to articulate that interest, that influence, or more, more um, realize that influence. But that's maybe with the United States, maybe alone is, is hard, obviously, because the United States is such a big uh, player here, right? But the United States and Europe together would have more than these, it will be more than the sum of its parts. That's exactly I what I just to say that, uh, I, I mean, if Europe wants to exert some influence, it has to go together with the United States. Europe alone will not be able to do no, anything. I agree. We, we I agree. have always given a lot of financial support uh, and uh, this is going to continue. There will be also a demand, enormous demand for resources the moment the war is over and rebuilding starts and so but uh I, I I think we we have to be very careful about a, a serious consolidated approach uh between uh, United States and Europe in, in, especially in the aftermath of the crisis Ava I wanted to make a point on the topic from a slightly different angle which is that, um, you know, just while the United States, you know, sort of, what should we say, uh, political elites are wallowing in their unhappiness about the decline of American competence and power, et cetera, this, the outbreak of this crisis demonstrated, um, it reminded us that the United States still has unique diplomatic agility um, because we're, we're really better at crisis management and at crisis response than the large European collective. But for the issues that take a lot that take that work out over a longer, slower process, the European Union is still, you know, in some ways has a different skill set than the United States. I mean, I think of the European Union leading the JCPOA process, which the United States could not have done ourselves on the nuclear agreement with Iran. You know, that was a European led process because it was it was a little bit deliberate and took time to cajole all the parties and Europe eventually got the United States from being an observer to actually joining the table and rolling up our sleeves and participating in the drafting. So there's a complementarity to America's diplomatic skill set and Europe's skill set. But I, I quite agree with your point that should there be an international um, uh, initiative to get back on track for a two-state solution, uh, Europe and the United States, I assume, will be very close partners. But it does raise the uh, uncomfortable question of whether China and Russia need to also participate. Um, that you know the West alone cannot be the the only player. You're going to have to have. Uh, key Arab states given a lot of responsibility. And then there is this question of whether the Security Council and, you know, if it was a question of approving peacekeepers for Gaza, um, what do we do about the, the sort of east-west split that is emerging uh, between, you know, the West still generally aligned to a liberal world order and the big Asian powers uh, really uh, wanting to block that that approach. Yeah. Completely right. I, I, what, whatever the the political solution will be, uh, it it will need uh, very strong and very effective international security guarantees for Israel as well as for the Palestinians. And this is where Russia and China then come come into play also as as uh, as parties to as the possible solution. Uh, talking about uh, sort of the way out, 
do you see uh, what do you see as a political solution to the situation? I mean, we uphold the two-state solution. That's the 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 legitimate international legal basis for the Palestinian demands in a way. But uh, um, one also has to be realistic. We have to see the situation in the West Bank. You see the settlements, you see the uh, settler activities, and so it's not getting any easier. And uh, there's also sort of, it implies the question, uh, what kind of leadership on the Palestinian side is going to emerge? Because mm -hmm. Fatah is discredited to a certain extent and Hamas will be annihilated if... I, I think the outcome of the October 7th attack and the consequences is that for the Israelis, it will probably make the, the, it will make them realize that the two-state solution is the only solution. Don't look at, again, we, we are looking at the immediate, the anger, the, the war, but once the war is over, once an accounting is done in Israel, my sense is that these guys will realize that, look, they are living with the Palestinians next door, the Palestinians are not going anywhere, Yes, Hamas is an awful organization, but other Hamases can emerge as well if this situation is not resolved. Do you want to live with this for the rest of your existence? I think these guys will probably come with, an, again, remember, there will, there will be a new government, a new political system uh, emerge. This is what happened after 1973 when the uh, Yom Kippur ended. There was a major uh, commission, the Aganat Commission, and essentially undermined for a very long time the Labour Party uh, for its uh, its mistakes in in the war. Now, so the same thing is going to happen here, but it takes time. But I think that the two state solution is now what will be. And when you talk to to a number of people, you look. When you look at the settlements, yes, they're a problem, but not some of the settlements are were constructed by people who did it for economic reasons, not for political reasons. And so those can be either uh, you can do land swaps or you can uh, convince them to move out. It's the political settlements that, that are a problem. But if the, the political movement that supported them is discredited in Israel because of the war, Right? They will lose a great deal of support and they will have a choice. You want to stay there? Fine. The bigger problem, I mean, and the, the, that to be solved would be Jerusalem. I mean, Jerusalem is really the, the crux of the matter. It is not the settlements. Yeah. The settlements can be dealt with. It's how do we do with, deal with Jerusalem? And there you have to have some very imaginative thinking. I don't have it. Um, and that's where the hard work will come. But I think new leadership in Palestine, new leadership in Israel, um, is will probably bring people who are more willing to compromise than before. One, two, in terms of new leadership in, in Palestine, I don't. I think there's this uh, guy Gershon Baskin. I don't know if you mm -hmm. know him. Uh, he has been pushing some very interesting ideas, including uh, the release of. Uh, Barghouti from Israeli jail, who has kind of emerged as somebody with an enormous following among Palestinians and um, kind of a natural leader. I mean, so you need somebody to replace the aging PLO leadership, etc. Um, and finally, I would say that, look, we are very close to recognizing, I mean, look how many countries recognize the Palestinians as the representative of the Palestinians. So in effect, there is recognition. I mean, maybe Israel doesn't do, but Israel de deals with them. Um, so we are this close to recognizing juris juridically the, the existence of a two-state uh, uh, solution. And I think we're almost there. The war has to end first. Let me just raise the, the hard alternative, which is that spoilers in both Israel and in the Palestinian camp uh, play with this idea of the one state solution. And they either, depending on where you live, believe that 
it could remain the Israel as the dominant player and Palestinians given their rights, uh, or from the Palestinian point of view, that you would you know, turn the clock back to pre-1948 and Jews could live as a minority in a democratic state, a democratic secular state in which there are diverse communities. And, you know, this little playing with the idea of the one state solution has been around for a long time. Uh, unfortunately, I think that some ideologues in both camp, both communities are going to, you know, use it as a um, as an alternative. You know, they will block consensus on trying to get to the two state solution. And I would not minimize the problem of dismantling settlement. You know, Israel did do the hard work of imposing uh, resettlement on the Jewish settlers that were that had lived in Gaza and they were forcibly taken out. There was some violence. The Israeli police had to come and you know arrest people, but they got them out. I think it's much harder in the West Bank. Um, I think there's different historical attachment to sites there to you know to the narrative, et cetera. But just let me just one last point. I think the Palestinians under the current conditions, are revisiting the trauma of the partition plan and um, in ways that I guess some of us who are far away from it um, may not completely appreciate. They've kind of taken back the, the, the perception that the partition plan, which did enjoy international consensus, was absolutely unacceptable to uh, Palestinians and some of their Arab uh, neighbors. So. Um, while we're saying very comfortably that from a Western international consensus diplomatic perspective, isn't the two-state solution the only game in town, um, people turn the clock back and say, we never bought into it. We never, you know, we have Resolution 242, we have the Arab peace plans, we have lots of more recent documents suggesting that Arabs would live with the two-state solution. But in the trauma of today, People are going back to the Nakba and 47, 48, and they're saying it never ended. So for them, their rejection in 47, 48 is still viable, is still the correct position. So I, I think these are pretty strong headwinds against moving easily back to the two-state solution. Yeah, but still it's, it's um, as far as I see it, the only feasible way to proceed. Yeah. I mean, you... The one state solution uh, uh, has a plethora of other problems. Okay. That, uh, For sure. Not For sure. only the ones that you have uh, that you have yeah. mentioned, but uh, I mean, it goes to the core, really, that goes to the core of the idea of a Jewish state. And, and, and so it's, uh, I, I think there are so many problems attached to it that, that I don't see that as a feasible option. Even in spite of Nakba and, and the attachment uh, that people uh, still feel to that for Palestinians' uh, traumatic event in their in their history, um, I, I still think the the partition resolution and uh, the two state solution is the only legal base from which one can mm -hmm. proceed. At the moment, yeah. The only thing I was going to add is I think the the one state advocates in Israel are such a small minority that it's not they, they don't provide. I mean, on the Palestinian side, it's much more important. I mean, for the reasons that Ellen mentioned and maybe is being revived. Yeah. But on the Israeli side, I mean, we're talking about a very very small minority that exists in every society. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for for that conversation. I enjoyed it. I think we have a lot of work to do, and, and we have to sort of pool all our creativity and all our determination in order to come out of that horrible situation that we are in at the moment. The repercussions are very, in my opinion, very strong. And yeah. you feel it also in, in the social situation uh, in the European countries uh, where uh, all things are 
at the moment surfacing that we had thought are sort of gone for good, but they are still there and they are yeah. coming. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for, for thank being you. with us. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you for your insights. All the many good wishes. Thank and you. Thank uh, you. we hope we will have another opportunity to talk soon. Hmm? Thank you, Eva. And happy thank holidays. You. To you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays to you too. And all the best for the new year. Mm-hmm.